And I don't feel like you need to be Ben Casey or Perry Mason or a character on Law & Order SVU or CSI to come to the conclusion that this is not a suicide, this is clearly not a suicide, and that this is a homicide and needs to be treated as such. Murder or suicide? That's the question that has been asked for 11 years in the death of Joanne Matuk. Her body was found in the Detroit River. The case is still open. No one has been charged or arrested. But there is a person at the center of controversy in Joanne's death, her cousin, Tim Matuk. Who would want a 55-year-old housewife dead? It remains one of the area's biggest mysteries. What happened to 55-year-old Joanne Matuk Romaine? Police believe Joanne Matuk killed herself. Her family believes something more sinister happened to this mom of three. They've reported their allegations to police in their civil lawsuit and sharing them with us now. And she goes, if something ever happens to me, look to him. We're like, that's a strange thing to say. Yeah. Kelly and Michelle Romaine recall the conversation they had with their mother in mid-December of 2009. They told police her mother was talking to her cousin Tim Matuk on the phone that day while they were in the room. We all of a sudden just hear her yelling, like, at this person. We're like, well, what the heck's going on? And she's like, you need to, she, I never said you were the root of everyone's problems. I told you to keep your nose out of everyone's business. Joanne hung up, giving that warning. You know, if something happens, look to Tim. Michelle said her mother never gave her specific details, but was worried. That's when all the craziness really started to happen. What kind of crazy? Like she was being followed. Joanne shared her fears of her cousin Tim to others as well. According to this affidavit filed in the civil case, paralegal Nancy Barish said Joanne told her, Tim Matuk said to me, if someone wanted to get rid of you, they could do it and you would never be found. She was kind of planting that seed because she was fearful. I think she didn't want us to know as her children how scared she truly was or she didn't want us to be in danger either. Or going to her paralegal and saying he threatened to make me dis but he would ever know what happened to me. Which is, is kind of odd because that's exactly what's happened here. She disappeared, she's dead, and nobody really knows what happened. So who is Tim Matuk? He was a Harper Woods police officer at the time of Joanne's disappearance, now works as an investigator with the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. More on Tim in a moment. But first, let's give you a little family history. Matuk family drama started years ago when after Joanne's parents died and left money for their children, the sibling war began. Two sides divided. That's, that's when the division started happening. So. And from what we've learned, much of the controversy was over the fact Joanne continually helped and supported her brother John. I was very close with her. I talked to her three or four times a day. John Matuk has made headlines himself, at one point landing on Crane's 40 under 40 list for his business accomplishments. He also made news when he was convicted of writing checks with insufficient funds, as well as false pretenses. Despite John's troubles, Joanne stayed close with her brother. That was the closest to my mm -hmm. sister, I mean, other than her, her three children. She wouldn't tell me that conversation that she had with Tim and she, And all she kept saying was, we need to go to the cops, we need to go to the cops. To he the cops. too believes his sister's she death is suspicious. He remembers arriving to the scene at the church that night she went missing and recalls his conversation with police. I and mean, he said, what is going on here? You, got, you guys saw footprints going to the lake on the, on the pavement, but the pavement didn't have any snow on it. That's when I thought, there's, a, there's an issue. There's a major issue. She never walked into that water, never. That was a staged crime scene in front of that church. The whole thing was botched. Now, let's get back to two weeks before Joanne died. In an attempt to smooth things over, Michelle says her mom went to Woods Wholesale Wine a few weeks after that call with her cousin Tim. The hope? To talk with her brother Bill, who co-owns the store, to try to stop the family fighting. 
The daughter's story of what happened that day was reported to police. Yeah, I drove her to the store and she's like, I'm just going to go in and, and talk to my brother, even though they they had an estranged relationship. She didn't talk to him often at all. Um, she's like, I'm going to go tell him about Tim and how he called. So she went upstairs unannounced at the liquor store and she came out more freaked out than she was when she went in. I don't know what she saw. I don't know what she heard. She wouldn't say what the conversation was about. She wouldn't say what happened up there. She just wanted to go to church and pray, um, which tells me, you know, she walked in on something. She heard something she shouldn't have known. She was more freaked out than I've ever seen her in my life. She was scared. It's like she knew something was going to happen. She didn't know what. She just knew something was going to happen. In a court deposition, Joanne's brother, Bill, yes. describes a much different encounter that day inside the wine today. shop. I just wanted to make things right. We um, uh, haven't talked to you in a long time. I feel bad about everything. Um, um, that's about it. You know, I want to make amends. She said, um, you know, you talked to Cousin Tim and... You shouldn't trust him. I said, why? I said, he's a good guy. Why shouldn't they trust him? I got no reason not to. I mean, what's, we're, I kept telling, explaining to her, like, we come in and we visit. What's the trust factor? We're not in business together or anything like that. So I, I told her, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing not to trust him about. And how long did that meeting last about? Probably a, a minute or two. Under oath, Tim Atuk testified he never threatened his cousin Joanne. I said, Joanne, why would you tell people that I am the reason why John's got so many problems? Her response to me was, you're just nothing but a big troublemaker. I don't even want to talk to you. And she hung up the phone. Did you at any point in time in your life ever express or imply to Joanne Matuk Romaine that you would have her disappear? No. So why all this attention on Tim Matuk? Well, besides what Joanne allegedly told her daughters and the paralegal, there is an eyewitness whose statement, if believed, puts Tim at the scene of Joanne's disappearance that cold January night back in 2010. After learning about Joanne Matuk's disappearance, Paul Hawk came here to the Gross Point Farms Police Department to share what he says he experienced on Lakeshore Drive that night. Police did not deem him credible and didn't share his statement. That is, until the Romaine family sued the police department for access to the reports on their mother's case. This is the affidavit that was filed in the civil case from Paul Hawk. He stated, on the night of January 12, 2010, he was traveling north on Lakeshore Drive. He observed a heavyset woman with dark hair, dressed in all black clothing, sitting on the break wall of Lake St. Clair. She was sitting still, motionless, and was slightly slumped over. He became concerned and suspicious. Hawk goes on to state, I further observed two vehicles parked illegally in the road. I observed two men standing near each of the cars. According to Hawk's statement, one of the men motioned for me to drive through. Hawk stated he went to Gross Point Farms Police, met with the chief and two officers for 40 minutes, handed in a statement. Gross Point Woods Public Safety Officer Anthony Shalott interviewed Paul Hawk. Uh, I believe Mr. Hawk had a credibility issue. But Hawk wouldn't let it go. Years later, Hawk stated in the affidavit, after seeing a photograph of Timothy Matuk, I can identify with absolute certainty that he was one of the two men I saw on the side of the road January 12, 2010. Hawk's affidavit was stricken by the judge in the civil case, not allowed as evidence. Was Hawk right? Police didn't deem him credible. Now, for the first time in 11 years, Tim Matuk breaks his silence. You know, this is just a pure and simple evil witch hunt. Enough is enough. Tim Matuk says it's time to speak out on the death of his cousin and clear meantime, his name. I felt, felt like I was being maliciously prosecuted by them when they knew I was not anywhere near the church. Coming up, Tim Matuk in his own words, his alibi, and his phone records from that mysterious night Joanne went missing, never shared before, until now.